All right, now I'd like to welcome to the show Patrick McLaughlin, Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Welcome to Free the Economy, Patrick. Thank you. It's my pleasure to join you. All right, now, so we're here to talk about government regulation, especially at the, the federal government level. So you recently had a fascinating and perhaps infuriating uh, article about how some of the regulations that govern us aren't even available for regular Americans to read and inspect they're actually published by outside groups, and they'll charge you if you even want to see what they've written. How did how does this how does this happen? Yeah, this is an interesting and murky world that I found myself in. It's um, the term here to know. I'm going to use it a lot today. Is incorporation by reference. So what happens is a regulatory agency, this could be in Washington or it could be at the state level or even the local level, it could be a municipality, but some regulator uh, is looking around for examples of what to do in a certain area. What, what regulations could they write, say about train safety or some environmental protection regulation, pick your topic, it doesn't really matter. And they come across uh, some standards sometimes that have been developed by other organizations. Uh, so you can think of something like the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME, or, or other groups like that, that are often developing very useful standards for their own industries for some specific issue. And sometimes the regulator will say, those standards seem to be really good for the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm just going to make those regulations. And to do that, they use this, this term of art. Again, incorporation by reference is the term. Basically, what it means is they write a regulation. And in that regulation, it says, see this other document written by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers uh, for the regulations that are relevant in this area. And they don't put the whole document in the regulations. They just reference it. And then if you go and try to find that other document, sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. And uh, this is this is the issue that I've been digging into lately. It's a lot more uh, frequent that sometimes you can't find it than I think anyone really ever knew. And so I can I can get into the some getting some numbers there. Like how how often are they hard to find, and what do I really mean by hard to find? But that's that's sort of the big picture issue here. There's regulations that are published not inside regulatory codes themselves, but elsewhere and just referenced by regulatory code. Well, yeah, and I, you pointed out that uh, some of these are, you know, so they're published by outside groups. Those outside groups uh, charge people money to access them because presumably it costs them some money to write them up and maintain them and whatnot. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe sometimes they're, maybe these are like membership groups or if it's like you said, if it's a society of engineers. You know, everyone pays their two hundred dollars a year to be a member of the society, and then all that you know gets uh, worked in together. But some of them can actually be be quite expensive. So you would have to pay a significant amount of money to even know the rules. That you know, imagine you are making you know train safety equipment, right? And so you need to know what the like train safety equipment rules are. Well, the government regulators said, well, we're just using these you know these engineer rules over here. Go to the engineer association, but then the engineer association wants to charge you what ten thousand dollars to tell you what the rules even are. Yeah, they're usually not that expensive, but some of them are that expensive. Um, and yeah, the let's back up for a second. You you made a, a good point there, what I think is worth emphasizing. The production of these standards isn't cheap. Uh, it's not free. And so the, you'll have private sector enterprises getting together. Maybe it's a society, maybe it's a trade association, maybe it's a, just a single company itself, uh, develop standards so that you know uh, different cell phones can use the same wireless technology, 5G. That's an example of a standard developed by a consortium of, of cell phone and other sorts of uh, companies in that area. And that's not free to develop, obviously. Now, if a regulator comes in and says, I'm going to use that standard, whatever it is, as, as regulations, you now got an issue because sometimes those standards are behind paywalls, as you said, but the regulation should be accessible to all people who need to follow it. So that's where we've gotten to. Uh, in fact, so let me throw some numbers at you. Um, when I went down 
through the Code of Federal Regulations and tried to find all of the examples of where a regulation is referencing an external document, where there's incorporation by reference. This, this in and of itself is hard to fully wrap your head around because it's not a standard way of, of using this sort of uh, incorporation by reference. Sometimes you can find a regulator will use the phrase incorporation by reference very specifically, but other times they'll use different language. So if you're just searching for a given set of search terms like incorporation by reference, you can find it anywhere from 5,000 to nearly 23,000 times, depending on what you've searched for in the federal code. Um, so that's sort of like I, I used the word murky earlier. That's that's sort of murking up the situation to begin with. But luckily, there was a database that I was able to mine. The um, National Institute for Standards and Technology has been keeping track of when standards um, developed by like engineering societies are incorporated by reference. And so they have this database. It's available online. Um, and it has about 20 three, 24,000 rows in the database. Most of those are duplicates. And what I mean by that is there will be two or three or four or on average, five different areas of regulation that will reference the same external standard. So mm -hmm. on average, each standard is referenced five times is what I found. So, all right, so now we're getting down to a smaller number. We've got 5,000 roughly individual standards that are unique standards that are incorporated by reference into the federal code. I went through and looked at every single one of those and tried to figure out how many of these are actually accessible. Cause I, I had no idea. Like, I don't think anyone knew just how often do you run into paywalls when you're trying to read a regulation? And the answer is nearly 40% of those were behind paywalls. So this specifically is 2,269 of the 5,689 standards were behind paywalls. The most expensive of these is, cost over $19,000 to get. On average, it's closer to $110. That's, that's the mean across all of these. And you, know, you, you get some lower prices as well, but you, you might say $110 to some companies isn't a big deal. I think the issue comes up when it's many of these at once. You got 10 or 100 that you're supposed to be potentially following. And that's for a startup, that's a big expense that maybe you don't want to bother with if you're not even sure if your minimal, minimum viable product is going to go out the door successfully or not. Right. Well, I know in in the course of, you know, explaining all this, you know, the that uh, that recent article you put, you, you wrote that put a lot of this together, I mentioned this, uh, one interesting angle that relying on outside experts instead of government bureaucrats themselves to write the rules uh, may be a good thing because uh, those outside experts may be more knowledgeable or whatever the industry is or the particular topic is. But at the same time, one of the big criticisms of government regulation that we often hear is that it's susceptible to what you know, economists call regulatory capture. That is the people that are being regulated end up sort of controlling the process because they're the, sort of the insiders and they're the people who know about it. Um, and that they, you know, can potentially use that process to write rules that benefit themselves. So is there is there any way to sort of square that circle and come up with a way where you sort of take advantage of specialized knowledge from, you know, smart people in industry without sort of handing over control to institutions that might be likely to favor themselves. Yeah, that's, I think there is, uh, it is definitely an issue though. I think anytime regulations are, are created, there's concern that influencers of regulations can make sure that they favor them as opposed to what, whether it's small businesses or potential new entrants or people that just don't have influence over the regulators for whatever reason, the time that they're crafted, but specifically for, for standards. So there's standards that are developed, again, by some, some private sector entity, some standard developing organization, and a regulator wants to use those. And, and you're right, uh, that, could be, that could be fine. That could be a good thing. It could be incorporating the best available knowledge into regulations. But maybe there's other standards, other approaches to solving the same problem. So what a regulator could do then is have alternative sets of standards 
it's going to make the regulations more voluminous, but you have, here's the first set of standards. If you want to just follow these, these are the ones developed by this society of engineers. You do all these things and you'll be in compliance. However, if you want to do have a different approach, here are the minimum performance objectives that you must achieve. So you can go back to train, uh, train safety. Uh, there's an example from that. There was... Um, old regulations, it's not specifically old like standards that were developed externally, but there were a bunch of old regulations about train safety that were on the books for, for decades. And then along uh, came President Obama and wanted to build high-speed rail. And he really pushed the Federal Railroad Administration to do so. The Federal Railroad Administration said, well, we got all these old regulations that make train design pretty tough and pretty heavy. Your trains end up being tanks because of all these safety regulations, and that doesn't work well for high-speed rail. You need you need lightweight trains. So what the Federal Railroad Administration did was that here's one set of standards, the old stuff. You guys are already making trains. You, you already know you're in compliance. You can follow this stuff. But here's an alternative set of standards. Your train has to be able to perform this well in this certain crash scenario. Um, and they put all these objective measurements of how well it has to perform. Uh, performance design would be the term here. So you could do that. So you could have a regulator say, all right, here's the standards we're incorporating by reference. Or if you want to achieve the same goals with other standards, other approaches, here's the performance metrics you must achieve. Hmm. Well, that, that does sound like an interesting idea, though I wonder how often you... Uh... You might end up with uh, both, which is that you end up with two sets of rules and you have to comply with both rather than getting to to choose one or the other. Uh, you know, I wonder how how often that there ends up being an actual reform and simplification, and how often it just ends up being a second and third and fourth layer of rules without kind of excavating back to to simplify you know what came before. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and ultimately, if the performance metrics, right, if the performance design standards that you're coming up with would lead you to potentially following the original standards that you were referencing, why do you even need to reference them, right? You could just say, here's the, here's what you have to achieve. Do it however you want to. If you want to pay for access to those standards that that other organization put together and follow that, that's probably going to work, but we're not going to put that into the rule book. You, the rule book says just this, and you must do just this. However, you get there, it's up to you. I think you're right. You could have a, a um, you could have confusion if there's multiple sets of rules, and you, then you get into some sort of issues where it just depends on which enforcer you're you're dealing with and whether that person's had a bad day or not. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we'll just pass the do not do not crumple your train rule. As long as as long as you have a no no crumple train, then it's fine. Uh, so so the phenomenon of having these like outside standards being incorporated by reference and then you know having to pay access to them uh, is you know an unusually obvious case where the system you know seems to have like an issue, but the you know the cash costs for you know paying for data sources for you know is isn't you know certainly the only burden involved here. Um, and maybe even not the, the biggest or most important one, you know, when it comes to figuring out what rules you're supposed to follow, because it seems to me just the sheer volume and complexity of a lot of existing rules exerts its its own costs, right? Um, whether, you know, whether it's on an existing business like we talked about, or, you know, the, the potential new startup that's coming in, people who don't, haven't already spent, you know, 20 years navigating the process and the, you know, there's just the time and energy to read and understand them even if they are freely available, you know, if you don't have to pay for them, is is significant. Do you think the people who are are writing rules today are really accounting for that sufficiently? Just the, the you know, because sometimes they, rule makers are, you know, expected to do like a cost to benefit analysis, right? So like this new rule creates so many benefits, but of course it'll cost the people who have to comply with it a certain amount. And so we kind of balance those things together. Do you think the the rule rule writers today are kind of weighing that complexity cost enough? I don't, um, and I think this is a a major failing, if not the the biggest failing of the regulatory process right now, at least at the federal level. the The regulatory process 
as it stands dates back to you know the Administrative Procedure Act created back in the 1940s, where the focus is on every new regulation, one at a time, pretty much in isolation, as opposed to looking at that regulation in conjunction with all the other regulations that have accumulated over time. And how do they interact? Or what is the what is the cumulative burden of adding that one more, uh, just one more regulation on top of a thousand? I was trying to come up with an analogy there, but so, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? If this right. is the final straw or not, you don't know if you're not measuring all the other straws that have been built up beforehand. Um, so no, I don't think I don't think regulators are generally focused on that, you know, and for good reason. I think that right now the system is set up to keep regulators focused on the new stuff, not on the old stuff, and that's that's a failure of the process, not so much a failure of regulators themselves. Um, I think if you did focus more on the cumulative burden, uh, or even just it could be cumulative positive, it doesn't have to be a burden necessarily, but just the cumulative effects. You you might see that having stuff behind paywalls, having stuff uh, or, or the scenario I described earlier where there's two different standards, uh, alternative standards, be more if, if there's some more complex way of of regulating, you create uncertainty in the economy. You create uncertainty amongst especially the small businesses. And I, I think that's going to have a negative effect. Uh, so as you know, I've done a lot of research on the buildup of regulations over time and its effect on, on economic growth sort of mac at the macro level. But I think if you think about this at the micro level, the individual business, you know, these, there's regulations, even if they're all accessible, but they're all over the place. That in and of itself just creates another, another hurdle for you moving forward. And maybe you decide not to go into that space or make that specific product because of too much uncertainty around, well, would I be in compliance with all these different regulations that are published by all these different bodies? Well, yeah, I think that's one of the kind of uh, underexplored areas here, whether there is less, less business development, less innovation in air in just sectors of the economy that are more heavily regulated in general, just because if you are, I don't know, you're a venture capitalist, or you're someone who wants to start a new a company, maybe you have a lot of choices into what field you're going to go into and you know you look at you know you look in one direction and then there's sort of like you know it's uh you know it's ai it's new and it's sexy and it's fun and there aren't a million rules about it already you're like oh should we do that or should i go into like you know health insurance which is extremely heavily regulated um and uh well which you know which of these is going to one give me more, you know, a greater likelihood of a uh, return, which is something any investor uh, asks, but which is also going to give me a thousand foreseeable headaches along the way. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And, and so, you know, you don't necessarily have to feel, you know, a huge amount of sympathy for like, you know, the venture capitalist in his office pondering this. But the point is that if an entire industry is too heavily regulated. There's going to be less innovation, which means there's right. probably going to be, you know, costs are going to stay higher. There's going to be fewer options. There are going to be fewer ways for, you know, customers uh, to benefit. Um, and there are, there's all, there's all sorts of ways in which government policy, you know, kind of, you know, uh, can potentially crowd out investment for a number of reasons. But this sort of seems to be one of those where, uh, you know, I, I remember I was at a, a conference a few years ago and there was a guy who had this startup and, and he wanted to uh, fix the, uh, you know, high cost of, you know, college and college loans. And and he has this system that was like it was like an insurance product where he's saying, like, you know, you pay me, you do your degree. And if you don't get a job within, you know, two years, then we pay out X amount of money. Right. Because we're sort of mm -hmm. insuring your degree, um, which is like, that's a really interesting idea, you know. But he said that, uh, you know, when he was like working on it, every everyone he talked to said, oh, no, no, don't go to insurance. It's way too heavily regulated. You'll never you'll never figure it out. You'll have to go through the process in every fifth in all 50 states. Uh, it's not worth it. Do something else. You know, and he he kind of believed in his idea. So he ended up doing it anyway. But I mm -hmm. think that there's a lot of conventional wisdom out there in like the business world that keeps people out of areas where they could be developing good products just because there's this scary aura of, oh, there's, it'll take me two years to even figure out the rules I'm supposed to be complying with in the first place. 
It was one of the appeals of the internet when it was first created um, back in the, well, depending on who you're asking, but basically in the mm -hmm. 90s. But, you know, that reminds me of a story. Uh, Sergey Brin, one of Google's co-founders, uh, was talking about Google Labs one time. And this is this is probably five or 10 years ago that this happened, but he was talking about these moonshots that they would take at Google Labs. You know, people would pursue whatever crazy idea they had in mind and see if technology could solve the issue. And so one of the products that the lab was creating was these contact lenses that uh, could measure your blood sugar level. And so it'd be useful to, to diabetics. Um, and so he was talking about the fact that they were able to make this. It worked really well. You had data fed into your phone at the time or laptop. And maybe these days it'd be fed into a different device. But uh, and then he went on to say, however, we're never going to take this product to market because it would be a medical device in that area. It's just far too regulated. And it's not an area for Google to focus on. So it's exactly your point. Hmm. Well, yeah. And the just to go back one one step to what you said about you know the which which regulation is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back you have so you have companies that are have you know you have one set of regulations that like every company in America that's an employer has to follow because they're in their rules for employment and you know complying with you know department of labor rules and then if you're a manufacturer there's probably a whole new there's a new set of rules about you know manufacturing and then if you if you have certain byproducts that that might potentially be uh pollutants then the, there's a lot of epa regulations that you have to be part of so for for some of these companies it's not just here's these 10 rules that regulate your company they're like levels of of rules, some that everyone has to follow, some that certain that only apply to sort of certain industries, and then some that only apply to sort of certain specialized companies that do very specialized things. Uh, and they sort of, you know, like you said, they interact, they have a almost sort of like, I feel like they can have a synergistic effect, or maybe a, a negatively synergistic effect, if you want to put mm -hmm. it that way, where, so there's one rule that is estimated that it'll cost, oh, well, it'll cost industry $100 million to comply with this rule. And there's another rule, and it'll cost $100 million to comply with that rule too, but when you pile them on top of each other, maybe it ends up actually costing them 300 million instead of two because that additional, because they interact in ways that the people who wrote them didn't plan for. And perhaps because they're in completely different agencies, right? So they wouldn't be expected to work together. Or, or even at different levels of government. There's interaction there too. You have, you have state regulations that reference federal regulations and local regulations that reference state and federal. And so it, it gets even even worse then because you're maybe interacting regulations at one level of government, but then going across levels of government and then and adding into that the external publishers of regulations, too. And, and I agree that the interaction effect, uh, the, the, the negative synergistic effect could be larger than just adding up the, the sum of the cost of individual rules. If you think about you know constrained optimization, if you got just one constraint and you're trying to optimize over that, if you did just pretty simple, but if you have two, three, ten, and as you get up more and more, it the the cost of optimizing isn't linear. You don't just add every new constraint, it doesn't just go up by by one. It's nonlinear and you can get to the point where it's so complex just by adding on a few more constraints that there's no amount of computation can can optimize for this for this problem now, that's the same problem that's basically faced by businesses everywhere and as you add on more and more i think i think you end up rather than rather than picking the op, rather than picking the optimal path you just end up with a lot of uncertainty. No one can really know all the different regulations that potentially apply to them from all the different levels of government, from all the different sources of regulation. You just pick the ones that you think are most likely to come to, to affect you, most likely to be enforced, and, and you move forward. At least that's for the small businesses. You know, the large businesses, they they have plenty of lawyers that can figure all this stuff out. I'm <laughs> I'm not asking for sympathy for them, although I am concerned there too. I don't think that's the most efficient way to be using their resources either, but they're probably much better at spending time looking at all the different levels of government and all the different documents and figuring it out, figuring it all out. Well, yeah, I guess uh, when you have uh, a huge number of potential threats, it you know obviously makes sense to focus on the ones you think are the most likely. So, you know, you you look out for the tiger in the jungle, but maybe you don't see the poison tree frog that's mm -hmm. <laughs> right above your head. Um, 
So one of the, you know, one of the questions I get from normal Americans among when I, when I have the unusual, uh, experience of talking to normal Americans who are not, uh, beltway nerds, uh, like, uh, yourself and I, uh, is that, uh, what, what does all of this stuff mean to ordinary people? And so you, uh, uh, you kind of mentioned it where, uh, you know, if a billion dollar, if a billion dollar company has to spend a bunch of money, uh, extra money that, you know, comply with a bunch of complicated government rules, like, what does that, what does that have to do with me or my family? You know, I mean, those big companies can afford it. Right. I mean, I just, I just want to make a living and, you know, buy a house someday, uh, potentially. Um, and you know, I'll be interested to see what you say, but I mean, my response is that, uh, Yes, a big company can obviously afford uh, compliance attorneys better than uh, someone in their, uh, you know, started doing a startup in their garage. But ultimately, that is kind of that's just a, an overall loss <laughs> for for the economy in general, which means, you know, we've got we've got fewer jobs, you know, uh, fewer raises, fewer stock dividends and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. What do you what, what do you think the takeaway is for? Why should an ordinary person care about this? Well, let's address this in two parts, maybe. Uh, the first part is just regulations overall and how how much there is on the books at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, a few years ago, I figured out how long it would take to read through all federal regulations. And it's over. if you read as your full-time job, make, making some generous assumptions about how fast you could read, it would take you over three years just to get through federal regulations alone, um, and and I think that does have that does have consequence if those regulations aren't all generating that benefit. And there's just no way that they all are. Regulations that were created in the '60s, '70s, and that are still on the books may no longer have any relevance to modern society, but they are still creating some costs. There's still some. Some lawyer in in uh, on Wall Street it has to be aware of the possibility that a regulator might come in with that regulation and say you aren't in compliance with this, even though it doesn't matter. It's about fax machines or something else that <laughs> no one uses, but it's still on the books. Uh, so that's that's just an inefficient use of resources if people are complying with regulations that don't matter, uh, or, or even worse, regulations that actively harm innovation. So like the regulations I talked about earlier about trains, trains had to be designed with steel poles at the corners and all sorts of these heavyweight objects and you could do better with fiberglass maybe or, or better design. So that was impeding progress towards faster trains because old regulations were sitting on the books. So it's it's not just spending cost and time and, and lawyer efforts reading those things and making sure you're aware of the risk, but it's also preventing you from building a better product. And I think that's one of the main reasons that you know we should be concerned. You know, there's there's this this assumption, I think, that regulations, maybe not amongst beltway nerds like us, but uh, amongst the the general public that you know if there's a problem, regulations will fix the problem. But regulations don't always work. And I think that's that's an issue here. If you don't have, if you don't have a regulatory process that leads to people, regulators having incentive to look back at old regulations and seeing if they're actually working, and we don't have that right now, then you're inevitably going to have some accumulation of errors on the books, some regulations that don't do the job or that even create harm. And so that's that's the that's one big issue from just the total amount of regulation perspective. But then the other the other one here is all these regulations that are published by other, other organizations, the stuff that's incorporated by reference. Why should we care about all of that? Well, for one, I've spent much of my career trying to figure out how to measure how much regulation there is. And some, uh, some of that measurement, some of the data I've created has gone into a lot of research about the effects of regulatory accumulation over time and how that can slow economic growth, creates uh, these regressive effects as well, et cetera, et cetera. I can, you know, we could have a whole other podcast about mm -hmm. all the research that's come out of that, that project. Well, what we're also seeing is some, some policymakers want to fix this, not at the federal level so much, but at the state level. There are some states that have started doing things like regulatory budgeting. They're going to measure how much regulation there is on the books. 
And then they're going to tr try to either limit the growth like a budget would, or maybe even reduce how much regulation there is. This incorporation by reference stuff can pose a problem to, to measurement itself and therefore pose a problem to solving regulatory accumulation with stuff like regulatory budgeting. Because now, if you're looking only at the books, the regulation, the regulatory code itself, but regulators are doing using incorporation by reference to create regulations that's not on the books, then you've circumvented the policy solution. And so there's another issue. It's, I, you know, to the degree, maybe it's a little bit too wonky for the average American household, but it does mean that the problems described with the first, uh, you know, uh, issue that regulatory accumulation can, can hinder innovation, create harm, et cetera, those problems are harder to solve with the second one, things like regulatory budgeting, because you have poorer, poorer measurement. Yeah, I'm sure you could write an entire book about the uh, the horror stories of regulatory lookbacks where you sort of like look back on old regulations and you think to yourself, oh, my God, this is still in force. You know, right. I'm sure there's a state that has, you know, the code of conduct for the you know state association of eugenicists from the 1930s is probably still on the, you know, in a dusty uh, shelf somewhere. But uh, I would be I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, use this one example, since I talk about it all the time, of a an existing regulation from the past that is, you know, hit, not just sort of uh, a, a dead weight loss and that people have to spend money to comply with it and it doesn't really produce any value, but something that's actually like really stopping innovation from going forward is something really big like the National Environmental Policy Act, so we had that from 1970, that's statute, but there's a lot of regulations based on it, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the idea was that we really need to, to to look out for the environment in this country, and we need to make sure that big, especially things like building projects, uh, you know, go through this like process where we rigorously look at uh, at the any potential environmental harms and we, you know, report on them and figure out ways to remediate them. And for you know, for a long time, the environmental movement thought you know the the threat to the environment is big industrial facilities, is people building stuff, and uh, and so we want to you know make sure we don't like go hog wild with building new stuff. But now, uh, a lot of those same people, uh, sometimes literally the same people, or the people who are still working in environmental policy today, uh, have said, well, look, we've got a climate crisis. We need more renewable energy. We need dozens, hundreds of new solar and wind power. Uh, facilities. We need more windmills. We need more solar uh, facilities, more solar solar arrays, and we need to we need to start building them yesterday. Like, well, that process is actually really slow and expensive and difficult because of the National Environmental Policy Act and the regulations that are based on it. So that that's sort of a one that has been at least among people who are like you know environmental policy uh, people has been getting talked about more and more after the past few years, um, but. You know, a a big, very you know, well intentioned, serious uh, regulatory effort that is now doing arguably the opposite of what was intended, right? Yeah, I remember the uh, the term for this stuff that I saw long ago in grad school was a uh, green tape, right? Where there's environmental regulations that end up becoming red tape in the way of green projects, and it's the People have been aware of, of this for a long time. People have been writing using that term green tape since at least the 90s that I can think of. But uh, I think now the some of the the, the big stuff that you want to build to uh, help reduce carbon emissions uh, or, or other environmental harms now have become uh, technologically more feasible, cheaper to produce, basically. And mm -hmm. so now the, the issue is finally coming up. And it makes you wonder what what else is on the books, right? Like, what are the other things that are just waiting to surface? Because up until now, they haven't been an issue because maybe the, the products that they would hold back are still too expensive. We haven't innovated in that direction yet, but we will. And then we're going to come into another set of regulations, instigated by another act of Congress and had the same thing come up again. And you know, just you just wish that we were proactively curating our regulations to avoid these sorts of scenarios, as opposed to reactively hoping that we can change stuff once we finally realize, oh, wait, we need a bunch of solar panels. <laughs> yes. Well, next time uh, we uh, we should all we should come back on the show and go over the 
uh, federal fax machine safety regulations in great detail. <laughs> I don't know how long it would take to read all of those. I'm sure they exist. Uh, well, Patrick, thank you for uh, going over this. This is fascinating. I I, I did not know that you had to uh, uh, pay an obscure group of engineers thousands of dollars to know what uh, the law required you to do. And uh, hopefully now everyone does know as well. Tell us where where do we where do we find you your information your professional profile all of your your online sources. So the best thing to do if you want to learn about all the data that I've been making about regulation is go to quantgov.org q u a n t g o v dot org. And that's that's the source for all the data, uh, including how much regulation there is, who's creating it the federal, the state levels, which industries are being affected by it. There's links from there to different research papers. You can also find me at mercatus.org. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Econ Patrick, if people want to look there. I've been trying to put more, more content up on Twitter, especially about this incorporation by reference phenomenon. And let me leave you with one last number, if I can. If you wanted to go and purchase all of the, the paywalled regulations, at least all the ones I could find behind paywalls, it would cost you over two hundred fifty thousand dollars just to just to collect them all. Well, that's that's more money than I've, than I've got on me. <laughs> yeah, I think me and you both we need new careers if we want to actually read all the regulations that are relevant. <laughs> well, that's that's my new retirement project. Uh, well, thank you, Patrick, for uh, being with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.